If you would please turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. One of the most obvious and most common consequences of the fall of man that we see in the Garden of Eden uh, is the reality of the frailty of our physical bodies. Uh, we're actually very weak and it doesn't take a lot of effort to damage us. For example, when you were small, you fell and you skinned your knee. Uh, when some people are in their 20s and 30s, which most people believe is kind of the prime of our lives, uh, physically you can still be injured in an accident of some kind, uh, actually fairly uh, fairly easily. You can grow uh, weaker with age. Uh, we, we are prone to physical uh, ailments and diseases, and so all of these things uh, happen to show us uh, the, the weakness and the frailty of our human bodies. So all of this damage, of course, is from original sin. It's from the fall of, of Adam in the Garden of Eden. And we believe as Christians, of course, that Jesus came to reverse the effects of uh, the curse of the fall. That's why Jesus came. He died on the cross to reverse the effects of the fall uh, that we found in Adam and Eve and in the garden. So when we think about from that from our perspective, normally we think about forgiveness of sins, uh, being accepted by God eternally. Uh, but what about the curse of physical ailments? What about the curse of illnesses? What about uh, the curse of diseases? Does Jesus come to actually reverse those curses as well? And that brings us to our text today. Isaiah 53, 5 uh, says this. And speaking of Jesus here, it's a prophecy written 700 years before Christ came. So we know, but we know now it's speaking of Jesus and it says this. But he, Christ, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Or you might have heard, by his stripes we are healed. So how is this verse often used? Well, many times this verse is used to provide proof that through Jesus' death, he not only secured the forgiveness of sin and eternal life, but also the possibility, and some would argue even the promise, of physical healing today. Okay, that we can have eternal security through our faith in Christ, but we also have the ability to be forgiven, uh, of our, and not just forgiven of our sins, but the ability to be healed of physical ailments even today. And that the only reason that doesn't happen, some say, is because of our lack of faith in Christ. That it's there for our taking. It's one of the promises Christ has given us. And if we have a disease or an ailment and we are not healed of that disease or ailment, then what happened? Then what must have happened is we did not have enough faith. Uh, to do that, all right? For example, uh, in one church's doctrinal statement I found, they have a statement regarding divine healing. So if you look at a lot of church's doctrinal statements, you will see that they have a statement on, you know, sanctification, a statement on salvation, the nature of Scripture, God, humanity. This one had a statement on divine healing, and here's what it said. Deliverance from infirmities is provided for in the atonement and is the privilege of all believers. Deliverance from infirmities is provided for in the atonement and is the privilege of all believers. So the rest of their doctrinal statement would be very similar, if not almost identical, to ours. But it seems to me that what they're saying in this statement, because I think most people would agree that in Christ in eternity we are all ultimately healed. But it seems like in this statement what they're saying is, is if you have enough faith in Christ, then the power to be healed of diseases or infirmities or illnesses or sicknesses, whatever it is, is guaranteed uh, even today. Now, this verse is more common in what I would call Pentecostal or charismatic context, okay? And so it's not necessarily common in our context as a, as a Baptist evangelical church, but you will have friends who are born-again believers who will hold to this view, and they will use this text, Isaiah 53, as evidence. This doctrinal statement I just read, if you looked at the text to support that statement, they had Isaiah 53, 5 listed underneath that statement. So I wanted to talk about, is this the proper context? How can it be used? What can we think about? What, what, is, what is Isaiah talking about when he's talking about healing that will come through Christ? Uh, what can we think even about physical healing? We'll cover all of that today. But first, let's look at the proper context of Isaiah 53. It's one of the most common texts in the Old Testament, and it is a prophecy of the coming of Jesus. Now, we're going to read in just a moment Isaiah 52, the end of Isaiah 52, all through uh, chapter 53, but in that context, you will see uh, it speak of Jesus' life and who he was as a man, and even it will allude to his resurrection, but the primary focus of the end of Isaiah 52 and in Isaiah 53 is Jesus' sacrifice, okay? 
This was written 700 years before Jesus arrived on the scene. So this is why it's an Old Testament prophecy, because when you read it, it is clearly describing Christ. So with that said, let me read Isaiah 52, verse 13, through all of Isaiah chapter 53, if you'd please stand. <clears throat> Isaiah 52, 13, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they will see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned away, every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is being led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man his death, although he had done no violence. There was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied, and by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted, accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. And therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. You can be seated. So just the reading of this text tells us a lot about the overall context. What is the focus of the reason for God's servant, who we know, of course, now as Jesus? And what you see was it is due to sin, and, and this is why he had to suffer. And the idea of a substitutionary sacrifice that God provided so that he could forgive sinners. That is the focus of that text, primarily is the idea of a substitutionary sacrifice so that God could forgive sinners. Let me just walk through a couple of these verses we see in chapter 52, verse 15. It says, he shall sprinkle many nations. So here's the idea of blood being sprinkled, which was used as a sacrifice to appease God's wrath towards sinners. Chapter 53, verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. So the ability for there to be peace between mankind and between God came because of Christ's sacrifice. Verse 7, he was like a lamb led to the slaughter. Lambs were being slaughtered as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. Yet it was the will of the Lord, verse 10, to crush him. He has put him to grief, and his soul made an offering for guilt. So Christ was our guilt offering. Verse 11, by his sacrifice we would make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. In verse 12, he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So the overwhelming idea here is, and the overwhelming language used is ceremonial or sacrificial in nature, in that Jesus came as the sacrificial lamb to die in the place of sinners as the sin sacrifice. Human beings are guilty. They are under God's wrath. They face God's judgment. There needed to be a sacrifice if there was going to be forgiveness. And Christ came to be the Lamb of God. He was that sacrifice. And the sin of mankind was laid on him. He was our substitute. He bore the wrath of God in our place. In John chapter 1, verse 29, the, um, the, actually John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming, he said, This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The focus there is forgiveness and taking away that sin. In Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, and in John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, uh, the Apostle John called Jesus the propitiation for sin. As I've told you before, that word means 
to satisfy. That in Christ's death, God's wrath was satisfied on the cross. God did not overlook sin. He did not excuse sin. He actually punished sin in Christ's body on the cross. So the focus of Isaiah 52 and 53 is forgiveness by the blood of Jesus. The focus is forgiveness. So how should this verse be used? If we're going to use it appropriately, how should it be used? The first thing we need to understand is that God's primary concern is our spiritual healing. God's primary concern is our spiritual healing. There are other scriptures that talk about the, the nature of, I'm sorry, the, the focus of our, our priorities being our spiritual lives versus our physical lives. Let me just give you a couple. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, Do not fear the one who kills the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him, that is God, who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. So Jesus said, look, don't fear the person who killed the body. Fear the one that killed the body and the soul. That's God. Don't forget the spiritual priority here. And then when the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. And it holds promise for both the present life and also for the life to come. So he says, prioritize your spiritual life. You can train physically, and that gives you some benefit in the here and now. But spiritual training should be the priority because it benefits you now and it will benefit you in eternity. So we've already seen where the primary context of Isaiah 53 is a spiritual context focused on forgiveness and spiritual healing. But I want to drive that home a little bit deeper going into the New Testament. What the New Testament does for us is it clarifies the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written. The New Testament basically clarifies. So we see prophecies come to uh, fruition in the New Testament through the birth and the resurrection, even the death uh, of, of Jesus. And there's a, a lot of prophecies that came to pass from the Old Testament into the New Testament. So we have the Old Testament. And when the New Testament comes along, the New Testament writers, it clarified things for them. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll find that Matthew has the most Old Testament uh, quotes. Why? Because it was written to, Matthew's audience was Jewish believers. So it was written to Jewish believers, or un Jewish people, to try to get them to accept Christ as the Messiah, to make them believers. Okay, And what he did was Matthew was constantly tying what was going on in the life of Christ and going on in the life of Christ with the Old Testament to show, to clarify, say Jesus was the one you have been looking for. So is there any New Testament evidence related that can or related to Isaiah 53 or that can provide clarity? And actually there is. It's quoted directly by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2. So what I want you to do is I want you to turn to that text. I don't normally get you to flip around, but I do want you to see this in context. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to begin reading here in just a moment in uh, verse 20. So listen to what Peter said. He's writing to people who are suffering for their faith. They're being persecuted. They're going under all kinds of trials for their faith. And he says in verse 20, chapter 2 of 1 Peter, For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you do good and suffer and you endure, that is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to do this you have been called. He says you've been called to suffer. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him, that is God, who judges justly. Then he says in verse 27, or 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. So what healing does Peter refer to here? He says, by his wounds you are healed. He is directly quoting Isaiah 53, 5. And he says that so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So Peter says, when he says you're healed, what he meant by that was you're you have died to sin through your faith in Christ. And you can live to righteousness, which means sin no longer rules you. It no longer has power of you. You have the ability to fight sin, and it's not always an easy fight, but you have, through the Spirit in you now, the ability to overcome sin, okay? Then he says he bore our bodies, or bore our sins in his body on the tree. 
Peter said, we were straying like sheep. And sheep, remember, are mentioned that we had all like sheep gone astray in Isaiah 53. But now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. So another way that you have peace or, or that you have healing is that God has, has, through Christ, healed your relationship with him. So there's at least two aspects of healing here. Spiritual healing. One is spiritually, you're no longer a slave to sin. Okay? You can live for Christ through the Spirit. That's been healed. Okay? The second thing that's been healed through your faith in Christ is your relationship with God. You've been reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19 actually speaks of both of these realities. First he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. There's the, the, uh, the healing that's been given because of our forgiveness and our ability to overcome sin. You're, no, you're a new creation. You're no longer the creature who was stuck in sin. You're a new creation through Christ. Then he talks about reconciliation beginning verse 18. He says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So Christ reconciles us to God through his death. And then we have the privilege of sharing this message of reconciliation, known as the gospel, with others as has been entrusted to us. So apart from Christ, we have this terminal illness of spiritual death. Okay? And, and the judgment for that is God's the eternal judgment, God's eternal wrath in hell. And when Christ died on the cross, he took that wrath on himself so that now we are then forgiven and our relationship then is healed. And instead of being his enemies, instead of being like sheep that have gone astray, Peter says now that he is now the shepherd or overseer or guardian of our souls. So, so it's very, if you're going to use Isaiah 53, 5 to promote healing, it has to be in a spiritual nature because Peter clarifies it in 1 Peter chapter 2. And if you want to use scripture to justify, if you just have enough faith, you can be physically healed, that's not one to use. All right? that, that's not going to help your cause any because Peter very clearly, when he quotes it, says it's talking about spiritual healing. So with that said, I want to look more at the process of sanctif sanctification. If we're healed by Christ, then sanctification becomes the healing process. So if we now consider spiritual healing as the priority, we need to think of the idea of sanctification as the healing process that we go to go through, which will one day result ultimately in spiritual healing, complete spiritual healing. This is one of this is essentially what we looked at last week in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. Was that we saw that those who are predestined to be conformed into God's image are called, those who are called are justified, those who are justified are glorified. Okay? And that process between justification and glorification, justification and glorification happen in a moment. Justification at your salvation, glorification when you're face to face with Christ. In between is what we call sanctification. Alright? So think of Jesus as the antibiotic given to you to fight the infection of sin. Alright? So just to try to paint a picture if you have an infection and you go to the doctor, the doctor will look at that infection and he might say, that's a pretty bad infection, but no worries. We can take care of this. We can heal it. I've got an antibiotic. You just got to take you know, a pill a day for 10 days. That infection will clear right up. It's a common infection. This, we know that this medicine has 100% effectiveness. You start taking this, you're going to be healed. All right? When you take that medicine for the first time, the minute you agree to go through that regimen, your healing is guaranteed. Okay, your healing is guaranteed the moment, your ultimate healing, the moment that you take that pill. Okay? And then as you take the pill, what you realize is after day one, ah, the infection doesn't look all that much better. And after day two, you're thinking, oh, well, it looks a little bit better, but I'm not sure. Day three, day four, you start seeing progress. Day seven to eight, things are a lot better. And then you get to the point where ultimately you're healed. Well, think of this in spiritual terms. The moment that you decide to put your faith in Christ, your ultimate spiritual healing, a day when you will, there will no longer be sin, you'll no longer be tempted by sin, is guaranteed. You first come to faith in Christ, and all of a sudden, you know, the first little bit, you're like, I don't feel a whole lot different. I don't, things aren't changing all that much. And then after a while, you think, well, I see some progress here. And then you look back on your life after being a Christian for six months or a year or two years or five years and think, 
man, I've seen a lot of progress. Well, what's happening there? The change you're seeing taking place in you is the evidence of the promised eventual healing. Okay, spiritual healing is not, is, that's a promise to you. Okay, that's what God says is going to happen. The sanctification process is sort of God's way of confirming uh, to us, uh, and it's really a graceful way of God affirming to us, hey, I'm going to complete this task. I started it in you. You see evidence in your life where you're growing and you're being transformed. That wouldn't have happened apart from me. That tells you I'm going to complete the process. In, Paul, in uh, Philippians chapter 1, Paul said, I am sure of this, that he who began the good work in you will bring it to completion until the day on, on the day of Christ Jesus. So Paul wrote to, wrote to the Philippians. He had seen their spiritual growth. And he said, I see you've got faith in Christ. I've seen the evidence of your growth in Christ. That gives me confidence that it is going to be completed. One of the tragic things about a person who claims faith in Christ, but there's no evidence ever of it in their life, is I personally don't know how I'd find any peace in that. If I was the same person I was when I first came to faith in Christ, where's the evidence that I'm one day going to be glorified? Because there's no evidence that Christ is... If, if I'm not being changed by Jesus, where's the evidence that one day I'm ever going to actually be changed completely by Jesus? I don't know how people have confidence of their relationship with Christ if they've never seen any change. But if you've been able to look back in your life and say, hey, I came to faith in Christ and I've seen changes. It's not always as fast as I'd like it to be. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. But I can see the progress. That's God affirming in your heart. See, I'm changing you. And if I'm changing you now... I will complete it in the future. Paul also wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1. In Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So he says the Holy Spirit was given you at your salvation as a guarantee, like a deposit, to guarantee of the inheritance that you have coming. And that's not just talking about warm, fuzzy feelings of the Spirit. Okay, that, hey, Jesus and the Holy Spirit make me feel good. He's talking about the actual work of the Spirit in your life. There should be evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And the evidence of the Holy Spirit is not just the warm fuzzies in your life. It's the actual changes that you see that have been brought on by the Spirit transforming you. Paul said that's given to you. The Spirit's given to you as a deposit to show you, hey, the rest is coming. You, somebody gives you a deposit... What does it say? You know, I, so we bought we bought more cars in the last two years than I ever wanted to. I can tell you that. Um, and we go and we we lay down. We find a car we like. We put down a deposit. What are we telling the people we're putting down a deposit? If we're putting down this. We're serious. We're coming to get the rest of it. Okay, that's what you do when you put down a deposit. Especially, on, and by the way, the Holy Spirit is a non-refundable deposit, which usually is bad news in our case. But when it's coming from God, it's good. It's a nice, and I'm putting the Spirit in you. It's not in front of me. He, he's going to stay, and you're going to see the transformation power in your life. So the sanctification process is the spiritual healing process that's working in us today through the power of the Holy Spirit, giving us confidence in our eventual and final and eternal spiritual healing. Again, it's not always clean. It's not always as fast as we'd like it to be. There are still struggles. It, there's a Galatians talks about a war in our heart between the flesh and the spirit. And so sanctification, I told you, it's a difficult process. It's a messy process. It's not for the faint of heart. If you just want to float through life and be sanctified, it's not going to happen. There's spiritual warfare involved. But it is the promise of God for those who are his. So your relationship with God through Christ has been healed. And your ultimate spiritual healing has been guaranteed by Jesus' wounds. You are one day not going to battle sin because sin will not be anywhere and you will not have a nature having been transformed into the image of Christ completely through glorification. You will not even have the desire to sin. That sinful nature will actually be completely eradicated. So we get the idea, okay, we understand what Isaiah 53, 5 is talking about. Spiritual healing. <clears throat> but what about physical healing? Let's just touch on that for a moment. And I do want to say this, physical healing is possible today, <clears throat> but it is guaranteed eternally. Physical healing is possible today, but it is guaranteed eternally. So no one is saying that physical healing is not possible. And no one is saying that when physical healing does happen, God shouldn't get the glory. Of course, if physical healing happens, God should get the glory. But I would like to make a couple of points, uh, just kind of drawing a distinction between physical healing and spiritual healing. 
First, a person can experience physical healing apart from faith in Jesus, but not spiritual healing. A person can experience physical healing apart from faith in Christ, but not spiritual healing. God in his providence and for his purposes may choose to heal a person physically, even miraculously, who doesn't know him or profess faith in Christ. I'm sure there are hundreds, if not thousands of people, and maybe you know someone who got a diagnosis, goes back to the doctor, and the doc and comes back and says, it, it, the doctor's like, this is a miracle. It's just a miraculous healing. But you knew that person wasn't necessarily a follower of Jesus. So God can choose to heal a person physically apart from that person knowing Christ. But God has never chosen and will not choose to heal a person spiritually apart from faith in Christ. If you're healed physically, you're guaranteed one more breath. If you're healed, healed spiritually, you're guaranteed eternity. So there's a distinction there, which I think is why the physical healing takes a back seat to the spiritual healing. Because even think about the miraculous of raising Lazarus from the dead. Guess what? Lazarus died again at some point. You know, I mean, that, he was going to die again. All right. Secondly, no matter how hard we try to maintain our health, and no matter how much healing we may experience or desire to experience in this life, we are wasting away and there's nothing that you can do to stop it. Okay? You're welcome for that wonderful bit of news today. Okay, with those two things in mind, again, physical healing is possible. I'm not saying it's not possible. And I think we ought to pray for somebody's physical healing. I'm not against praying for that. We should, certainly should give God the glory when it happens. We should, out of our concern for others, pray for people's physical healing. There are no issues with this. But we have to set priorities. And the priority is always the spiritual side of the equation, not the physical side. Remember, this goes back to what we talked about last week when Romans says, Paul wrote Romans, all things work together for good for those who love Christ and are called according to his purpose. We define good as that which helps transform us into the image of Christ. Okay? So, in, in this case, you can actually have a physical ailment. Okay? And, and the promise of Romans 8.28 is true. Okay? But you may or may not be healed, healed physically. There's, there's not, even Jesus, when Jesus, Jesus did not heal everybody he came into contact with. He healed those who God led him to for God's purposes in that moment. There were hundreds and thousands of sick people. Okay? Jesus didn't just heal everybody. God has his reasons for why he gives healing to one and not another. Okay, so we have to put our hope in the eternal. But the Bible also talks about our eternal bodies. Okay? And in some way, Jesus did, on the cross, he did guarantee, and through his resurrection, really, he guaranteed our physical healing. It's just not guaranteed now. It's guaranteed in eternity. All right? If you go to, you don't have to turn there, but if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is writing, describing our bodies, and he refers to our bodies as tents. Okay? And here's what he says. For we know that if the tent, that is our earthly home, is destroyed, our earthly body... We have a building from God. So he says we have a tent that's being destroyed, but we also have a building from God. He's talking there about our heavenly, our spiritual body, our resurrected body we will one day receive. He said that's a house not made with hands. It's eternal in the heavens. For in this tent, in this body, he says, we groan. And you know that's true because it happened to some of you this morning when you tried to put on your socks. You groan. Why is it so difficult to reach my feet? It used not to be this hard to reach my feet. So I tell Pam I bargain with my feet every morning. You come halfway, my hands will come halfway. We'll make a little compromise. We'll meet in the middle here. Okay? <clears throat> so we groan. Our bodies groan longing to put on that heavenly dwelling. This, our physical bodies as they wear out start to long for the, the heavenly body we're promised. He said, if indeed putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. Not that we would want to be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may swallow up, be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we have to lay this body down one day. When we do, though, he says, you're not going to be without a body. You're not, he's called, you're not going to be as like you're going to be naked without clothes to put on or a body. You lay on this physical body to take up this, your spiritual resurrected body. So this body is a tent. All right, now, I'm not much on camping. I like the outdoors, but at the end of the day, 
I want a hot shower and I want food and a roof, uh, you know, somewhere with running water and temperature control rooms, okay? So, maybe some of you know more about camping than me. You probably do. You can go buy the nicest tent you can imagine. Just look it up and find the nicest tent made out of the most quality material. And you can read on how to take care of that tent. And you can store it like it's supposed to be stored, and you can only maybe take it camping under certain weather conditions so the weather's not hard on it. You may treat the material so it lasts longer, do the maintenance you need to do to the tent. But you know what the reality is? One day you're going to throw that tent away. It's going to wear out. Time. It's just things are just going to wear out. So our physical bodies, we can take care of them, and we should. Okay? We can eat like we're supposed to, and we can exercise and do everything we could, but it is going to wear out, and there is nothing you can do about it. You're going to have to lay it down. When you lay it down, there's the promise of the resurrected body. You don't just lay down the old body. You pick up a new body, which is basically in the image of Christ. Jesus' resurrected body, 1 Corinthians says, he was the first fruits of those raised from the dead. We said, well, he wasn't the first one raised from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead. What that means was he was the first one raised from the dead, never to die again with that resurrected body. Okay, now I don't know what his, I know it was a physical body because you could touch him and he could eat. I also know he could just appear in rooms. So it's a body created for the eternal. My personal convictions is it was very similar to the, the bodies originally that Adam and Eve had. Okay, and then sin made us corruptible where we can now die and get injured, but then he's going to restore us back into that non-corruptible body. Okay, and so that's why Jesus is, whatever Jesus' body was like from a resurrected state, that's what our resurrected bodies will be like. And then Paul also describes the resurrected bodies in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. So the body you have to lay down that was sown through natural means. You came into this world by natural means. Okay, what is raised, the body that will then exist, can no longer die. It will be imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. That just means it was sown under the curse. But it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now, if there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. He says you have to live in this physical body first, then you die, then you can take on the spiritual body. The first man, who's Adam, was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man was of heaven. Adam was born from the dust. Jesus came from heaven and put on flesh. As was the man of dust, so are also all those of dust. That's all of us. And as the man of heaven, so are also those of heaven. Just as we have been born the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of man of heaven. So he's saying if you were born of dust, if you were born of natural means, which we all are, then you will go the way of Adam. You will die. Okay? He said, but if you know Christ, the second Adam, and you put your faith in him, you will also go the way of that Adam. And that Adam is the way of, yes, death, because Jesus died, but then resurrection in a glorified body. And that's the promise. So he describes it. It's going to be imperishable. It's different. It's made for a different, quote, unquote, atmosphere. Okay? Your physical body is not fit for the heavenly realm. <laughs> one of which is it's full of sin. Okay? But one day, we will have a body that is fit for the heavenly realm. So while physical healing may or may not happen... For Christians or anybody in specific situations, for Christians, physical healing is actually guaranteed. There's coming a day where you will not hurt. And if we have shoes in heaven, you'll, you'll not have a groan to put on your shoes and socks. You'll not have the aches and pains. And you'll not hear people complain about, well, I've been in heaven. Heaven's great for the first four million years. But the, last, you know, the second after four million years, you should really start to wear out a little bit. None of that. Complete perfection, no decay, no deterioration. You're there as good as you're ever going to be, and you stay as good as you're ever going to be. So how are we to prioritize or summarize this today? Thinking about the physical, the balance of physical healing and spiritual healing, and how we're supposed to think about our physical bodies and our spiritual bodies. And I'll close with this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want to read it twice, because I really want you to hear what he's saying here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart. 
Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So Paul's writing to people who are suffering, they have physical ailments, they're being persecuted in faith, he says, don't lose heart. He says, your outer self, in fact, he says, all of our, our outer self is wasting away. But at the same time our outer self is wasting away, our inner self, the spiritual, is being renewed day by day. And he says, all that you're going through, he says it's a light momentary affliction. And it's actually preparing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. He's saying God is using the, all the physical suffering around you, whatever it may be, to renew the man inside. Okay? To prepare you for this weight of glory that will be all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So Paul says, don't lose heart. Your body's wasting away. You're going to suffer. You're going to get sick. You're going to die. But the whole time that's going on, for the believer, the inner man is being renewed day by day. That means the person in the worst physical condition, who's just before they die, can actually look at anybody with integrity and say, I'm the best I've ever been. Well, this body's wearing out. But the person in me is continuing to be transformed. So take care of yourself physically, but understand the spiritual realities are the ones that should be the priority. And all of it's guaranteed in Christ. I mean, all the, our physical healing is ultimately guaranteed in Christ. Okay? But there's also a sense in that we've, we're saved, and we're being saved, and we will be saved. So you were justified, saved in a moment. But this process of sanctification, sometimes the Bible says, calls it our being saved. It doesn't mean you're earning or working for your salvation. It means you're seeing the result of your salvation, which is, here's the great thing about sanctification. I like to remind you of this. Sanctification is the evidence that it has happened, okay, and the guarantee that it will happen. Your sanctification is the evidence that you have been saved in Christ, and it is the evidence that one day you'll be completely saved in Christ. That's, the, that's why we grow in our faith. It's God's gift to us, even difficult times. Well, how can we have joy in difficult circumstances? Because it's, you know, when we go through things in life which aren't what we wanted, and I don't know, has it happened to anybody lately? I'm just asking. <laughs> if we go through things in life, we can say with a smile, this is all transforming the inner man. This is God is using this for good. Okay? And I'm wasting away, and I could get sick, and lots of things can happen, but inside, I've got nothing to worry about. Because God's even taking every all the illnesses and even infirmaries, and everything I'm going through to transform me spiritually. And all of it is guaranteed in the end. If you'd bow your heads. The first question I would ask is, have you dealt with your need for spiritual healing? Okay, that's the first question is, have you dealt with your need to put your faith in Christ? Spiritual healing can only come through Jesus. You cannot be reconciled to God apart from any other person. You cannot know God apart from any other person. You cannot avoid God's wrath apart from Christ. There is no other way. You believe that what Isaiah 53 teaches, that Jesus was the Lamb of God, sacrificed for sins. When you put your faith in Him, that blood is applied to your account. Just like the blood of the Lamb was sprinkled, the blood of Christ is sprinkled on you and you are forgiven. Just like the blood was put above the doorpost in Egypt for God's people and the death angel passed by. So on the day of judgment, you having had the blood of Christ applied to your life, the day of judgment will pass by. And then believe that God raised him from the dead. He came back to life. He was the first one. He was unique. He won't be the only one. With the difference is he raised himself up from the dead. He'll have to raise us from the dead. But he's the first fruits. What, what happened to Christ will happen to us. <clears throat> and if you will put your faith in Christ and trust Him and believe that He is Lord, there's no one above Him, He's God in the flesh, you have no way to be forgiven apart from Him, and just say, Jesus, I'm trusting you, He will absolutely forgive you. You have taken that sort of sin antibiotic and He is changing you 
And in the moment, you may not see it at first, but if it's a genuine faith, if it's a genuine trust in Christ, you will begin to see the work it does. And you will begin to see the transformation. And he has given you the promise that he will complete it. If you have put your faith in Christ, just make sure you prioritize your spiritual healing. We all want to feel well. We all want to be physically fit. We should all take care of ourselves physically. That's a stewardship issue with the physical body God has given us. But we should not hold on to these bodies too tightly. Because like everything else, they're temporary. And they're going to be tossed aside. And so make sure that your emphasis and your priority and your focus is on your spiritual life, not your physical life. Make sure that your greatest concerns in life are over your spiritual health, not your physical health. Make sure that your prayers for yourself and others focus more on spiritual realities than they do physical realities. Because that's what counts. Father, we are grateful that in your great mercy you sent your son Jesus to be that sin substitute to bow on the cross. And that in him all has been guaranteed. Father, the spiritual healing, reconciliation to you, which we can experience and know now, and then grow in that relationship. And then ultimately, Lord, you have even promised physical healing in eternity through the resurrection of Christ. And so we owe everything to him who has done everything needed to make us complete both now and forever. We pray these things in his name. Amen.